what are some of the key elements you see to define someone as a high performer, right? Whether it's personal development or business, what are some of the key attributes there? Dipping back into the subconscious programming, um, I do think it is undoing a lot of the old beliefs, right? It is those limiting belief systems that take place in our mind that keep us from having the confidence to do what it is we want to do. And so in order to do that, it's not all about the doing, doing, doing. I think it's about the undoing and the un, un, unprogramming because we've been so programmed from a young age. The smallest thing, it's nobody's fault. That's the crazy thing. It could be the smallest, like you were presenting your show and tell, right, at school and somebody said one little thing and it, it impacted your confidence and it stays in your brain until you kind of understand that unwire it and then rewire it. And so I think the ability to get grounded in reality, like what is the reality of your skill set? What is the reality of your abilities and get out of get your get out of your own way. Stop taking everything so personally. And I say that in the kindest way possible because it's really hard to do. You know, like of course when we blow up on social media and we get those negative comments or whatever else, like it impacts us. And it is learning how to move through the tough times. So I think that's another element to it too, is getting really used to going through hard situations. Like I'm talking criticism, disappointment, discouragement, all the things that people are deathly afraid of because probably when we were younger or in school or whatever else caused us a lot of pain and your brain is wired to avoid pain at all costs. So now you have to reteach your brain like, hey, rejection is not painful. It's actually direction, right? And we have to reteach our brain all of these things. So I hope I answered your question. I feel like I gave it, gave it in a large, large amount of words. I think that was great, Lauren. I, and, and we're all about getting deep here and having fun. And so, you know, we might have to have you un, unwire, you know, undo some of Brock's stuff like on the fly here. <laughs> I got you. He, he, he already told me he'll be vulnerable. So <laughs> I think we got to go deep with Brock. But first, and I don't know if you mind this or not, but like, is there, and you don't have to answer, but is there anything that you particularly in your own mind had to go back and undo so that you could, you could break through some of these limiting beliefs and, and start your coaching business and get, and get to where you are today? Oh, absolutely. And I'm grateful you asked because I love to share my story. Uh, in the beginning, it was a little tough, but now I feel like people trust me more as a coach as well when I share that, like, hey, I'm human too. And so I'd say people pleasing, uh, there's a few, but people pleasing in particular was really tough for me, uh, especially going from part of a real estate agent or somebody in real estate, like part of the reason I believe Everybody chooses their career subconsciously because they've got like inner internal goals they want to achieve like, achieve like interpersonally. And I think real estate people are rather people pleasers. And so for me, learning to put everybody first, everybody first, I think was something that I adopted from childhood. I grew up with a single mom and I felt the need to always put my brother first and some of my environments at times were rather unsafe. And so I had to constantly be on this kind of survival mode as to like, okay, how can I keep everybody happy, comfortable and safe? And I think others will relate to this too, like making sure everybody's comfortable so that I don't get criticized. I don't get rejected. I don't get yelled at. I don't get in trouble. And so when I got into coaching, I did end up partnering with uh, some people that really weren't in alignment, but also tried to kind of take over my business. And I had to I had to move through this and I had to do the whole people pleaser pendulum swing, like going from a people pleaser to all the way to I could do it myself. Nobody bother me. Nobody talk to me. I'm going to isolate myself. And then I had to come back in the middle and I had to learn how to say no without feeling like my body was going to shut down, without feeling like I was not safe. And so how did I do that? I had to go through some healing. I had to understand where it came from. Where is the origin? And how can I speak to that age self and let her know everything's okay now? So I had to move through that. And this is actually my coaching framework. 
we start with the healing. So I had to attack the limiting belief. The limiting belief is I'm not safe if other people are uncomfortable. And then I had to attack the mindset, which was the fear, right? And I had to understand where that fear was coming from, fear of rejection, fear of abandonment. Then I had to attack the behavior. This part's really important because every time I didn't say no or did something I didn't want to do, it sent my brain a confirming, validating my limiting belief of my needs are not important. So it took a hit on my confidence every single time I would people please. That's the message my brain was getting. My needs are not important. So I had to change my behaviors. And for any of my fellow people pleasers here, the best way to move through people pleasing is not to go straight from being a yes person, saying yes to everything, and then going straight to saying no. You want to take small steps. And the first thing I had to do was come up with a little plan for myself because I'm like, this is scary. Like just tell people no or to stick up for myself and tell people something doesn't work for me. So I would say, let me let you know. I'm not sure yet. Let me get back to you in an email. Let me get back to you in a text. So my response to everything was, I don't know for a little while. And it was such a key thing because my brain started to change. It started to integrate safety and it actually started to build a capacity for me stepping into my power, me stepping into my confidence and actually stepping into a higher desired life that I knew I could have. And so if now I'm at now I'm more at the no space, depending who the person is or depending like where I'm at, because I was such a people pleaser. I was so like wired that way. Like in my mind, I didn't have any agency. Like I didn't even have any clarity. I didn't even know what I wanted. So this helped me regain agency and clarity over like who I am, what I wanted. So now I'm at the point of like, I can say no. And I also sometimes say, I don't know, let me get back to you or let's circle back on that. So still moving through it. I think it's always a management process, but that's a big block that I've worked on personally. I think it's great. I mean, so I I also am a people pleaser. I And I don't know, I started trying to think through like some of the roots of it. So you might have a new coaching client. I don't know if you're taking new clients, but I might have to give you a call to work. I am. I got you. Back to the, you know, the root cause and we'll just, you know, isolate that shit and get it out of there. But I think I say yes to so many things. One, because I'm just so opportunity oriented. So somebody has a new business idea, somebody has new something. I'm like, ah, yes, let's do it. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh shit, I don't have any time. I have negative time and then and then I'm like rushing through workouts working out is a big is a big deal to me but I'm always like and then I don't stretch at the end of them and it's like oh because I over committed to like everything and then and then I want to make sure that I do it well and then all of a sudden I don't you know I all of a sudden I don't I don't get the sauna session like Brock does for an hour a day you know like I don't get to do that because I over committed to so many different things and and I don't like letting people down especially people that I um you know, that I like, that have done me well, like, I don't want to have to let them down. But it's also, if you do that, then you're letting yourself down, uh, in a way by not by not and and I do have pro- my priorities straight. And I definitely know what I want. I mean, I think I spent a lot of time on goals. I think I was already talking about that just programming the subconscious. But that's one thing that's very interesting that I'd, I'd love to work through with you. So we can take that. We could do it on, you know, live. But I really want to get into Brock's limiting <laughs> beliefs too. Well, I, th- I had a comment on that. I mean, I think the like con- the topic of confidence, right? I mean, it's it seems like there's a small percentage of people that just naturally have high confidence, right? Like no matter what, they just always walk in the room with high confidence. And I feel like confidence plays such a big role in like everything in life, right? Whether it's success in your career or business or uh, you know, relationships or whatever it might be. Dating. Con- yeah. I mean, confidence plays such a big role in all of that. Right. I think it's interesting to think about like going back, that it's not necessarily something that in your mind right now, like you go back years to unpack why there's a confidence issue is super interesting. And I feel like the, the whole movement of mental health is just like, has boomed so much over the past couple of years. Right. It's real like back in, you know, 10, 20 years ago, right. Our parents age was you know, especially like on the male side, right? Like you don't, you don't talk about your feelings, right? You kind of, you just bury it and like, that's, you're not supposed to talk about it. Uh, but it's like so yeah. prevalent now or, and it's, it's super interesting. Cause it's like, you're trying to achieve, be a high performer. 
a lot of the things you wouldn't think are important are super critical. Absolutely. And honestly, even just like, I mean, everybody um, feels anxiety, feels, you know, about certain things, right? Like it, 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 and, and, and back in the day I would have been like anxiety. I don't, I don't know what that is. You know what I mean? But now I'm like, dude, everybody, I feel it. And now it's like recognizing when I feel it. And I'm like, oh, I'm just feeling anxious about something. And then what it is, it, and I'm trying to work back in my mind and what that is and, and then sort of step away from it and be like, well, I'm just feeling anxious about this because of whatever. And you know, it'll pass or whatever. That's yeah. how I deal with it a little bit, but well, all right. So going into, I, I, I guess I could share like some, so like the deep over, I feel like something that a lot of people probably struggle with. Or I know sometimes I struggle with is overthinking things. Right. And it's, it could be something that's so small that doesn't even matter, but it's like you spend 20 minutes in your mind playing out these different scenarios and overthinking it. And it just leads into potentially negative thoughts, right. That spiral on throughout the day. How, how is something like, is that a common thing you see? And like, if so, like, how is that, how do you generally address that? Yeah. Overthinking. I love overthinking only because it's such a, it's such a compass because overthinking is your mind's way of avoiding feeling feelings. So there's something underneath that overthinking that wants to be addressed and you need to address it. And I love how you guys said like, when anxiety comes up because it's not about avoiding the emotion like it's not about feeling like um you know incapable because you have anxiety it's not about not feeling good about yourself because you have sadness right it's about learning to feel these feelings and process them and be okay with them and you have to let yourself feel feelings and we're human i think we try to be robots sometimes but we forget that's part of the human experience is to feel and if we don't allow ourselves to feel then we're we're not we're not going to enjoy this life we're not going to be able to be present in this life so overthinking really is a byproduct too like there's something beneath there that needs to be addressed there's either a suppressed emotion and it's your brain telling you like hey we're trying to avoid this like Let's let's overthink and let's overanalyze everything. Like I know something makes me really nervous when I calculate. I'm a numbers person in my head. I'll calculate every single thing in my head. And sometimes I'm like, I didn't even know I could do math like that. But my brain will just go crazy and just calculate everything. And then I have to sit down with myself and say like, what are you so nervous about, Lauren? Like, let's sit down and let's have a little internal dialogue and a little internal conversation. And so that's why I do that framework in that order because the limiting belief sits beneath the mindset and the fear and that overthinking and all the things that live in the brain. And so addressing what is beneath it and accessing that, that's a whole nother conversation because that takes time and work. But I do believe that is where overthinking comes from. That in addition to it is addicting, it is distracting, it keeps you not present. And so even Eckhart Tolle will talk about this, overthinking is an addictive behavior. And anything that distracts you from doing the hard things, being present in your body and being fully present with an experience is typically addicting, just like drinking, just like social media and things of that nature. So, yeah, it's just a little sign. 